Hello there. Good evening and welcome. My name is Ken Chea. I'm the president of the Linnaean Society of New York, and I'd like to call this meeting to order. Well, we've made it to December in a year like no other, one that challenged us in ways we couldn't even predict a year ago. How, as a society and individuals, did we manage to cope over the past nine months? Well, for me, it was putting on my mask and venturing out into New York City, where I live, and finding nature hidden and in plain sight everywhere. From small plants and blossoms, feeding even smaller pollinators to the amazing sights and sounds of that first big wave of spring migrants passing through our parks and green spaces. These, these were the things that got me through 2020. One bird, one insect, one flower, one tree at a time. Through it all, I always believed that community is possible and more than that, necessary. And you being here tonight with me demonstrates and confirms the importance of community. So thank you. Thank you for joining us. You know, when we were meeting at the Linder Theater at the Museum of Natural History, I used to say, thank you all for coming out tonight. But that sounds so 2019 now, doesn't it? So instead, I say thank you for joining us tonight at, in your home, and I hope that you will continue to be part of this community in 2021, and that you too will continue to find solace and joy and wonder and inspiration in the restorative power of nature wherever you live and wherever you may wander. I am delighted to be here tonight to welcome our members, uh, our friends, and our guests to the December speaker meeting of the Linnaean Society of New York. Uh, let's see, according to my participants list, woo, 202, 203, 203 three people are, uh, are now watching live. So once again, a warm welcome to everyone. I'd like to give a quick shout out to my team of fellow officers, council and committee members and past presidents of the society whose time and effort has continued to keep us moving forward this year. Without their hard work and support, we would not be streaming live right now or welcoming new members each and every month or reaching you through social media or sponsoring Linnaean field trips. They are great teammates and I am honored to be one among them. Tonight marks our fourth speaker meeting taking place live online and because of the great success so far of our online meetings, we plan to bring you more of them. We have no further news at this time from the American Museum of Natural History as to when we might expect to return to the Linder Theater. So once again, because of our great success of our online meetings, we plan to continue to bring you more of them. For tonight's program, a few ground rules. We have disabled the Zoom chat feature as well as the camera and microphone. One thing we haven't disabled is the Zoom's Q&A feature. During tonight's program, you may use that feature, it's down at the bottom of your screen, to send us a question for the speaker. Following the speaker's presentation, our Vice President Rochelle Thomas will take some time to select a few questions from the audience. Now, because our membership has the opportunity to vote by email, I have three business items to present this evening. And thank you, by the way, to all members for returning your votes. With 113 votes of approval and zero votes of opposition for motion one, I'm delighted to report that Vicki Seabrook has been elected as our newest council member of the society. Vicki, I know you're out there somewhere. <laughs> so on behalf of the council and the, and the membership, welcome. I really look forward to working with you in 2021. More good news. With 112 votes of approval, and again, zero votes of opposition, for motion two, it gives me great pleasure to welcome the following eight applicants as new members of the Linnaean Society of New York. Gail Page, sponsored by Frank Smith. John Maniscalco, 
sponsored by Ardeth Bondi. Daniel Atha, sponsored by Kevin Sisko. Caroline Richard, sponsored by Ken Chea. Erica Rosengart, sponsored by Alice Deutsch. David Schwartz and Susan Schwartz, both sponsored by Miriam Rakowski. And Claire Borelli, sponsored by Amy Simmons. So Gail, John, Daniel, Caroline, Erica, David, Susan, and Claire, and Vicky too. If any of you are out there right now listening, imagine you're hearing a thunderous applause bouncing off the ceiling and rolling through the aisles of the Linder Theater so loud it just woke up all the pigeons on Central Park West. Congratulations all and welcome to the Linnaean Society of New York. And by the way, if you're out there wondering about becoming a member, we would love to hear from you. Just go to our website, LinnaeanNewYork.org. You want me to spell it for you? Okay, I will. L-I-N-N-A-E-A-N-N-E-W-Y-O-R-K dot O-R-G. LinnaeanNewYork.org. And you'll find all the information you need. Just in case you need a sponsor and you don't know many members yet, I'll be happy to be your sponsor. I'll be happy to sponsor you. You can contact me about sponsorship or any of the other officers of the society. There's Vice President Rochelle Thomas, Treasurer Ruth Hart, Secretary Lydia Thomas, and Editor Jonathan Hyman. These are all outstanding choices, folks. So take your pick. Just go to the bottom of our website homepage, click on Contacts. There you will find the email addresses of all the officers I just mentioned, and you may contact any one of us about sponsorship or for more information. And please remember, any society or organization is only as healthy as its growing and diverse membership. We would love to hear from you and welcome you to our community. In addition to both motions one and two, motion three, three, excuse me, to accept the November general meeting minutes also passed by a vote of 109 to zero. So that's more good news. Clearly we're on a roll tonight. Again, I want to thank everybody who voted for doing so. It's really a very important part of what we do as members. And now at last, it is my great pleasure to announce this evening's speaker. Once you are attuned, every singing bird becomes interesting. That's every individual, whether flycatcher, vireo, chickadee, wren, thrush, there's no such thing as just a robin, sparrow, Blackbird, Grosbeak, Warbler, you name it. Get ready because tonight we're about to explore the diverse world of bird song. Songs and calls, female songs, song learning and dialects, mimicry, matched counter singing and counter calling, night singing, complex songs, repertoires, dawn singing, and the extraordinary beauty of all of it. Donald Krutzma is a bird song scientist and professor emeritus of ornithology at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. As a research scientist, Don published widely on bird song for more than 50 years with lifetime achievement awards from the American Ornithologist or, uh, Union and the Wilson Ornithological Society. More recently, he has authored books that introduced the general public to birdsong. The John Burroughs Medal Winning, The Singing Life of Birds, The Backyard Birdsong Guides, Birdsong by the Seasons, and Listening to a Continent Sing, Birdsong by Bicycle from the Atlantic to the Pacific. His most recent book from this year, Birdsong for the Curious Naturalist, this book right here, is a basic how-to guide that teaches anyone from beginner to advanced birder how to listen. This is the book that I recommended to my students and I used as my basic text in a bird song class that I began teaching this year at the New York Botanical Garden. It's packed with information and it features QR, QR codes 
that link to an online collection of, get this, over 700 bird songs. So you can grab your cell phone, and while you're reading this book, you could scan the code and listen to the bird that you're reading about. Does life get any better? I love this book, <laughs> and I think you will too. You can find it, well, you know where you could find it, wherever good books are sold. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome tonight's speaker, Donald Krudsma. Hey, Ken. I hope you can hear me. I sure can, Don. You're, you're on and rolling. Oh, wonderful. Ken, thank you very much. Uh, a very nice introduction. And, and what a pleasure and an honor to be invited into the homes of so many Linnaean Society members. Thank you very much. I remember fondly the, oh, it was about 15 years ago that there, I, we had an in-person walking those magnificent halls of the museum at night when they were empty, uh, a very special experience. Well, tonight, of course, we're talking about birdsong. And as Ken said, there is something restorative about nature. And for me, and for many of us, especially birdsong. So if tonight you join us and just frolic in the beauty of song on this dark, cold December night, why, that's fantastic. That's one level at which you can listen tonight. But of course, as Ken was saying, uh, there's a little bit more to this. <clears throat> I invite you to listen a little more deeply. And as that opening line in my abstract said, something to the effect that once you know how to listen or once you are attuned, every singing bird becomes interesting. <clears throat> Boy, excuse me. <clears throat> So I want to give a quick nod to the photographers. Our life as uh, bird lovers would be far duller if we did not have these wonderful photographers in our life. And here are, here are five who have contributed mightily to, to my life and, and the, the presentation tonight and the book. And also a shout out to my recording buddy and co-pilot in all these recording endeavors, Janet Grinsky. We're here chasing bay-breasted warblers up in the Connecticut Lakes region, walking old logging trails to find the birds we're after. So here's the plan tonight. It's, it, the goal is to take some key concepts and far fewer than I would love to. Oh, I, the hardest part about this talk was whittling it into 45 to 50 minutes or so. Uh, so we'll begin with simple to complex songs and we'll in, end with dialects and dawns, dawn songs. So first, we're going to warm up with the simple song of a black cap chickadee. Probably doesn't get much simpler than that. And I want to just think about the quality of sounds briefly here. On the top here is what we call a waveform. And over time on the horizontal axis, the breadth of these markers here indicate how loud the song is. So this chickadee, you might say hamburger or hay sweetie or spring is here. At any rate, the whistles are about equally loud throughout, but you see this little break here in the middle. And in the, in the sonogram, we'll be looking almost exclusively at sonograms tonight. I'm delighted that they've taken off in the bird, birding world considerably in the last decade or so. But here you see frequency on the, on the vertical and time again on the horizontal. So this first whistle is a little bit higher than the lower whistle here. And again, this break here. So I'll play this at normal speed as if we were out there listening and see if you can detect this little break here in this second whistle. Every chickadee I listen to, I listen for that little break. But you have to be close enough to the bird because otherwise the loudness of this whistle here will echo off intervening vegetation or obstacles and blur this little break in here. 
And many people have trouble hearing this, so I'm gonna play just this lower note and let's listen to it. I'll play it a couple of times. And then at a slower speed. I have pretty good evidence that at least two other species that we'll be talking about tonight can hear that break uh, mimics. So a, a, a typical chickadee, when we're listening to it during the daytime, and I have a whole bunch of these songs just squeezed together, they're hardly recognizable as sonograms, but all I want you to see is it's they're all equally distant from this arbitrary line drawn, drawn across here. So if you're listening to a chickadee during the daytime, you will hear it sing almost endless hey sweeties on the same pitch. But there's far more to chickadees than them singing on one pitch. If we go to the lower panel on this slide, what I've done here is I've taken 20 minutes from a more exciting dawn chorus of this individual, and I've extracted two songs from each of, oh, was it 10 or 12 different pitches on with which this bird sang. So first he sang a, a series of songs on this pitch, then a series of songs on this one, and then a series of songs on this one. So I'm gonna play these two examples and just, just hear him bounce around in frequency as he's working his way through the dawn chorus. as simple as the chickadee song is, there's nothing really simple about how he uses that song. And we think of chickadees having one song that's, hey, sweetie, but, but how maybe he has an infinite number of songs as he seems to be able to sing on an infinite number of pitches. Uh, so a remarkable singer um, and a delight to listen to. This, hey, sweetie song, another level at which to listen, there's the, the largest dialect that I know of in bird songs is this black capped chickadee occurring from the Atlantic to the Pacific, Nova Scotia to British Columbia. But on offshore islands or west of the Cascade Mountains where birds are resident and not subject to influence of, of birds uh, migrating and erupting, uh, there you have the classic song dialects that we'll be talking about a little later. So if we were in the book, we'd be on chapter nine, subchapter 9.1, and we would have gone through retardando, accelerando, and we're pitch shifting black cap chickadee, page 155. You can use the QR code as Ken suggested. You can go to this website, and I emphasize this website is free for all. You do not need to hold the book in hand to go to the website. And it's just chock full of, as Ken said, 700 plus recordings and 75 hours of recordings. Here's what the home page looks like. I love to explore it by chapter because after all, this is a book of ideas. And also by this explore. First, just a glance at the recordings by chapter. You can see the topics here. How a bird gets its song, more about song learning. One of my favorites, when, where, and from whom to learn. How do these birds decide? And that other section that I talked about mentioned explore, the explore sections. This goes back to my college days when the favorite course I took in college was a genetics course. I was never going to be a geneticist, but what was so exciting about this course was that about half of the time we spent talking about things that were known about genetics, the other half about things we did not yet know a whole world out there ready to be mapped and to understood. And it's the same with birdsong. There is so much that we do not know. Ironically, a friend of mine 50 years ago, her name was Robin. She said she was gonna study lizards because everything was already known about birds, but oh my, 
So I offer you 77 projects to go have some fun with and listen in some depth to what these birds are up to. So back to tonight. Let's run with this chickadee theme just a little bit. You've seen what's on the left here. And on the right, I have something that I heard in northern Michigan. And it said to me immediately, black cat chickadee. Now, you may listen to it and say, really? I'll, I'll go ahead and play it. One more time. To me, it sounded like an exaggeration of the black cat chickadee sound. Look, he's got these three whistles. He's got an exaggerated break here. But out of context, you would never know the species that sang this. And I offer him here, the brown thrasher, I think one of the most extraordinary songbirds you will ever run into. And what so excited me about that simple song that, I, that said to me, oh, that's a black cap chickadee imitation. Somebody else might say, uh, maybe it's a white-throated sparrow imitation, but it's not important where he got it. But what is exciting to me is that that is such a unique song that I know I will recognize it when this thrasher sings it again. And that was my goal. I had been trying for a situation for a number of years where I could sit and listen to a brown thrasher and by ear estimate how many different songs he could sing. I knew it would number over a thousand based on some earlier indications. So all I had to do was listen to this thrasher for umpteen hours, count how many songs he sang, how many were of this black cap chickadee or white throated sparrow, and do a little division. If he sang 10,000 songs, for example, and 10 were of my chosen sound here, what I call a handle, a handle that allows me to get a handle on the brain and what's inside this bird. If 10 were of my black cap chickadee, 10 into 10,000 leaves me an estimate of about 1,000 songs. So I'm gonna play a brief segment from this thrasher and I'll have you listen for that unique sound. And I think you'll pull it out fairly easily. It was too easy, I know. But now what if that one sound is not representative of all the other sounds in his repertoire? Maybe it's a favorite or a, a, a not a favorite. I need, I would, and it, so what if I had 10, 10 different handles for this bird? So I listened to this brown thrasher and I heard imitations of what I swear were these nine different species. And a number of sounds will be in stereo. This is one of its in stereo. If you don't have stereo headphones and you have two speakers on your desk, why maybe lean over and, and put your head between the two speakers because on the left speaker, you're going to hear the model, the actual black cap chickadee. And on the right speaker, you're gonna hear what I think the thrasher is mimicking. So we're just gonna run through these 10 sounds all at once uh, and I'll help, help follow along. I love this thrasher. And he takes, takes these sounds like that Northern Flicker long song, but the, the thrasher has his own style of singing. He has to con condense that into just a couple little notes, but overall remarkable imitations. And, I, and it's, a, it's a logical question to say, well, how do we know these are imitations? Uh, wouldn't a bird singing so many different songs eventually say something that sounds like something else we know? Yeah, but these are so good and 
Also, this bird has no Western birds in his repertoire. He's not imitated any Western birds that I can hear throughout. So yeah, th these have to be good imitations. So the bird I followed, oh, here's this, this beautiful hedgerow. He roosted right here. I was there in the morning waiting for him every morning that he, he sang for me. Alas, it was only three or four mornings because what eventually happens is the female arrives and he essentially stops singing. Basically, that tells you quite a bit about what song's all about, doesn't it? He is singing to attract a female. As soon as she arrives, job is done and he clams up. So otherwise I would have had hours and hours more. So I'm out there every morning following him along this hedgerow. So how many different songs did he sing? Well, here are the basic statistics. In 7,700 songs, he sang these 10 sounds, these 10 handles, a total of 60 times. One imitation every 130 songs. You have to be out there while listening to pick out one of these. So do a little math and he has about 1,300 different songs. Phenomenal. But I've made two assumptions I can think of. One is he's not making songs up as he sings. If he's doing that, why well, he can sing far more than 1,300. And I'm also assuming that those 10 imitated handles are representative of all the songs that he can sing. So a remarkable creature. I want to take it one step further though. A brown thrasher does not sing all alone. And what I love to do is, is step back and say, well, all right, that's one thrasher singing, but what's the next thrasher doing that we can hear? Well, they are doing something rather astounding. They are matching each other. So this is before the females have arrived, the males are singing intensely. Here's bird one and bird two, these two rows, and they are immediate neighbors. And I'm recording with a stereo microphone here. And this is just a visual look here. You can see that bird one sings this song, bird two follows immediately. Bird one, bird two, bird one, bird two. I'm not gonna play this because it's harder to hear with this interference of the other birds singing simultaneously. I'm gonna go on to the next one, and I think you'll be able to hear it here far better. And you can almost hear it better if you don't look at the sonograms, I think. The faint bird in the background is bird number two, and the near bird one is in the foreground. So if I play this brief section, just a little excerpt from this long sequence of what these birds are up to, you'll hear this faint in the background and then two repetitions in the foreground. So let's just play this twice. One more time. And we'll go to this one. Bird one sings it twice, bird two. So all right, I'm just gonna run through all six of these examples back to back and uh, again, this is stereo. You could, but just listen for that softer one in the background. You'll hear the matching going on. If you're so inclined, I challenge you to go to song number 235 on the website. There are eight and a half minutes where two thrashers are just battling it out. And I hear about 50 matches between these two birds. Now there's two ways that these thrashers could be accomplishing this. One is they are making sounds up as they go. Uh, we have no evidence they're doing this, but it's, it's entirely possible in English. I could say any combination of sounds and I think anyone in the audience could match that combination even if they are not words. Why couldn't thrashers be equally adept at their thrasher ease? making sounds up as they go, matching the neighbor immediately. The other possibility is that they are, they have these similar songs in their repertoires and males are pulling from that, that repertoire, the song that's needed on the particular occasion to match their neighbors. Uh, we don't know what they're, exactly what they're doing, but back when I was familiar with the neuroanatomical studies that were done on songbirds, the brown thrasher had, I think, by far the largest song control centers up in the brain 
to accomplish all that they must do with their singing. So very impressive. And if you like, you can go listen to three and a quarter hours from this particular ind individual and listen for yourself for some of those handles, estimate the repertoire for yourself. I can't think of much better to do with three and a half hours of time. So we step back again from listening to one thrasher, listening to two thrashers. Well, how did the brown thrasher come to be? We think about closely related species, California thrasher. So I love to look at closely related species and try to understand what the ancestral, in this case, thrasher might have been singing like. And I expected something very similar to the brown thrasher. So out in California, this particular male California thrasher woke, awoke in a small bush right here in Montana de Oro State Park. As I said, I expected something similar to the brown thrasher, but I was totally blown away by what this thrasher was doing. You see, on each day, he had a particular theme that he specialized in. Day one, day two, day three. Uh, if I lived out there, I'd have microphones out there every day all uh, during the entire singing season to try to understand what he's up to. It's like he's doing the exact opposite of what a brown thrasher is doing. He's withholding everything he knows and telling us just a little bit of what he knows each morning maybe 15, 20 minutes of a dawn chorus with this particular theme, and the next day, this particular theme. And I'll play several examples of songs with this theme and just listen. These are a little harder to detect, but when he gets to these repeated notes here, I think you'll pull it right out. So let's just listen to him. should listen to all 20 minutes, but that will suffice. It gives you the idea of what he's up to. Again, totally different uh, from the Brown Thrasher. And we can step out just a little bit further back and we're in Thrashers now. Why, there's another bird. These are the Mimic Thrushes, the Northern Mockingbird. Mimicry, we should celebrate the Mockingbird. Do we have a minute's time to listen to all this mimicry? I think we have to. I was going to skip over it, but oh no, not on a December night. So I'm just going to play. I have extracted this mimicry uh, from what my local mockingbird has did a couple summers ago. And just listen along to the imitations. I'll try to help you follow along. I love the last two because he's alternating those two sounds. And this uh, Mockingbird was quite good at picking sounds and alternating them like that. So again, we're celebrating an individual Mockingbird, but I have very seldom stepped back and listened to two Mockingbirds. And I had such an opportunity a couple of years ago in, in California. I'm often around prowling in the night, uh, getting to my recording location for the dawn chorus. 
and the windows are always down and I'm sometimes driving quite slowly, just listening for anything that might be going on. Lo and behold, this mockingbird was singing in the middle of the night. So I, I put a microphone here a couple of nights and mockingbirds are known to sing at night, uh, especially unpaired bachelor mockingbirds, sound carry especially well, but something different was going on here. And it wasn't the mimicry that was so astounding, but it was how these two mockingbirds sang the same song back and forth. We call this song matching. A lot of birds do it, especially cardinals and tufted titmice. But to hear what this mockingbird was doing was rather astounding. Here is one minute, a one minute section. And again, this is in stereo. Um, and I'm not sure it does you any good to follow along in the sonograms. You just want to close your eyes. It is dark after all. These birds can't see each other. I never saw the birds. Uh, and I've indicated where the matching goes on here. Look at this note here, this bird in the background. It's the same as what the foreground bird did here. And I'll pick another example here, the foreground bird, very loud here in the background bird singing the same song. So just to listen to what these two mockingbirds are doing, sight unseen, let's let that one minute roll. And again, it's stereo, put your stereo headphones on, put your head down between the two speakers, close your eyes if you want to. Wow, inevitably, I ask myself, I ask myself some rather anthropomorphic questions like, who are these birds? What are they saying to each other? What do they know about each other? What are they thinking? I use the word thinking for birds. There's something going on up in that head. And to me, it's startling that I don't hear any mimicry of Western birds in this whole sequence. I don't know if that's just by chance or if it's saying something about what's important when mockingbirds interact with each other, that they don't use mimicry. Uh, it's not totally settled as to, to what, uh, what mockingbirds are doing when they mimic the songs of other birds. So we're going to step back even further. We are still in these mimic thrushes, mimidae. And there is another bird in the same family, the starling that, well, I think it's a, it's a different subfamily, but we're still in the same family and it's a renowned mimic. And, and I think Bruce might have asked me before uh, the meeting started here, uh, when I saw any good birds today. And well, yeah, the starling, I, I know there's a dark side to the starling, but oh my, when they sing, I stop to listen. They have so much good stuff that they say that it's inevitable that I just have to hear them. What I and it's sad because starlings are so underappreciated. You have to be close to the birds to hear all the gory little details that they are singing. So I get the microphone up close to the bird. I have a parabolic reflector that brings that sound in, uh, collects it, physically amplifies it. And yeah, we have to hear this starling sing. We cannot. <laughs> I have to let the starlings speak. So they often begin with these very slow whistles at the beginning, often sounding like a red-tailed hawk or the whistles of a, you know, a eastern wood peewee. And then they're off and running. And there's so much that goes on here. 
And by the time they get to the end, why their whole body's into the song, they're flapping their wings, their throat is pulsating. It's, a, it's quite exhilarating to watch them. So I'm gonna play this whole thing. And then after that, I'm gonna zoom into two sections that I find especially exciting. First section is here. And if you, you might wanna turn the volume up a little on your speaker because uh, starlings don't sing that loudly. But, so we're gonna zoom in here, see what you hear there. And then we're gonna zoom in here. So let's let the starling roll. Wow. I wish we were in person. I would love to ask those of you listening uh, who, what you heard in this section and what you heard here, but let's go take a look. This starling is doing something that I don't know any other bird that does. He's mimicking two different species simultaneously. With the left voice box, he's probably imitating the lower sound here of a flicker. With the right voice box, probably the higher sound of the Eastern Phoebe. So let's listen. Most of us know what a Phoebe sounds like. And the flicker. And here's what the starling does. We need to hear that at least one more time. So you can tell he's using his two voices simultaneously because he has one thing going underneath, on underneath here and something entirely different going on up above. That other section I wanted you to key in on, here's the starling is telling you that he hears that little break in the second whistle of a black cap chickadee because look what he's done. He sings the black cap chickadee song and right in the middle of that little pause, he says, there's enough time for me to get a little starling sound in there. So he punctuates this sweetie with his some starling wisdom right there, and he does it again. This isn't by chance, but this is the starling knowing exactly what he's doing. And I mentioned the two voice boxes. Uh, I should elaborate on that just a little, I think. Uh, our one voice box is at the top of our windpipe. Birds have two voice boxes at the base of the windpipe uh, where the passageway bifurcates to the two lungs, and they can control these two voice boxes independently. And we think of, think of singing as precision breathing. It's just gating air through these two passageways and tightening muscles, the inter, inter, tiny intricate muscles in, in ways that are dictated by the memorized sound in the brain. It, it is a bit of a miracle uh, how this all happens, but indeed it does. Here is proof that Birds using two voices, and, and he's hearing that little break in the chickadee whistle that I hope we all heard. Going on, female song. Much has been made of female song lately. Lots of attention has been drawn to it. I'm not sure we've learned a whole lot more about female song, but at least we have been sensitized to the fact that not all singing is by the male birds. And for cardinals, uh, oh, I'm guilty. When I hear a cardinal singing in the spring, I say there's a cardinal, but, but really you need to put the binoculars on the bird to determine whether it's a male or a female because females sing just like the males. They each have about a dozen songs apiece. And the one situation in which females are, can reliably sing is on the nest, when they are incubating. So it's wonderful, you find a cardinal nest, sit up close to it, not so close you disturb it, but close enough that you can hear what's going on, you'll hear probably the male approaching the nest and the female responding. Quite often, but not always, she chooses the same song from her repertoire of about a dozen songs that he just sang. 
all four examples here I have of her matching him. So we're just going to run through this. Listen to these cardinals. And in each case, the male sings, the female, and then the male sings another song after the female, although I've pictured just one male and one female song. Cardinals make for wonderful listening opportunities. Males are often matching each other with the same song from neighboring territories. Here you have wonderful male-female interactions. Not a much better bird to listen to than a cardinal. Also, in the same uh, family, I think it's family cardinality, you have another pair of singers, the female grosbeak, rose-breasted grosbeak, and also the black-headed grosbeak sings. She sings from the nest as well. The male, of course, is this uh, Robin with voice lessons, just extraordinarily beautiful songs. And I say extraordinarily beautiful to our ears. Our ears are adapted for hearing things that are slow and low, and the rose-breasted grosbeak obliges. Songs of the Pacific Rim, why it's just a blur to our ears, but they're no less spectacular. They're just on a different time frame than our ears can appreciate. Now the female rose-breasted grosbeak uh, sinks from the nest. They aren't quite the same quality as the males. You'll hear that. And a wonderful experience. You find a rose-breasted grosbeak nest, sit near enough by that you can hear what's going on, and you'll hear the male coming in. He incubates as well. So you'll hear him coming in, he'll sing, she'll start singing, she'll start calling, giving that, oh, that, that sneaker on the gym floor kind of sharp call note. And the male circles around and finally the female slips off he drops onto the nest and sings just gloriously for a minute on end. It's hard to believe that this male is singing like that from the nest, that he wouldn't absolutely give the nest away. But in fact, that's what he does. Two more things that I'd like to illustrate about rose-breasted grosbeak songs beyond the male-female part. Two aspects of male singing. One is dawn song. The only time I have, well, twice I've experienced it, and both times were he's singing on the ground. And just like black-headed grosbeaks, speaks, at dawn they sing a long, continuous series of notes like this, and goes on for uh, several minutes here, as opposed to the day song, when he's singing from the treetops or from the nest. So I'm gonna play, I don't know how many minutes of dawn song I have here, but I'll just give you a flavor and I'll play some of it. Oh, hours and hours and hours. Uh, so dawn song. Very special things happen at dawn. We'll be talking about that a little more in just a minute. But the third thing I'd like to show you is, notice how in these sonograms, most of the sound occurs between these two lines that I've drawn here, in both the day song and the dawn song. And if you want to be technical, it's between two and three and a half kilohertz. But ignore the numbers. 
On the next slide, I show you courtship song. And the sonogram has exactly the same scale, both in time and in frequency. So look what happens when this bird is in courtship song. He's singing to her, presumably fairly nearby. Look what happens. Oh, wow. Here's where normal song occurs, but look what he is doing here when he is addressing her. He runs all the way up here to 10,000 cycles per second when normally he's down at three and a half. And look at the time scale. Look how these things are all spread out. I'll just jump back and look at this one again. There's so-called normal singing. Here he is pulling out all stops. Look at the difference in that. And if the normal singing rose-breasted grosbeak male is a robin with voice lessons, why well, I don't know what this robin, this uh, grosbeak is on, but let's play it. And I'm going to see if I can follow along. It's going to continue after eight seconds, but let's see how we do here. Some of you might have heard some uh, mimicry in there. I think he, I think he throws a little cowbird in there. I don't, that's not the cow, a cowbird singing. He's all alone here. So moving on, dialects and dawns, two of my favorite topics: how songs change over space, uh, showing song dialects, and what happens during the dawn chorus. I think one of the most exhilarating experiences uh, you can have listening to birds, being out there with listening for their first peep and following them through about a 45 minute dawn chorus. First, the Anna's hummingbird. I bring this up because, not just because hummingbirds are beautiful and cute and, and do fantastic things, but one of the most interesting questions when I posed uh, the question to a number of uh, people who study bird song some years ago, I said, if you could have the answer to any question around, about bird song, what would that one question be? And I think most people came back with the question, why do some species learn their songs just like we humans learn to, to learn to speak and other species do not? Why do all the songbirds have all these song control centers in their brain that enable them to learn songs and their close relatives, the flycatchers, do not? Why do hummingbirds learn? Why do parrots learn? And why do birds and all the other groups? I say that and I stop because we found example, an example of a song learning cotinga, which is related to flycatchers in that large group of what we call sub -ocene. So. So it's getting, a, the, the story is getting a little murky, but the Anna's Hummingbird, nothing murky about an Anna's Hummingbird. You have to see the song. It's a delight, but it happens so fast, our ears cannot appreciate it. So you see these broad band buzzy sounds and these dainty little notes here. And the bird will take this basic song and repeat it many times. So I'm gonna play just this one basic unit. Wow, that was fast. You got to play it again. Okay, we're going to slow it down. Lots of work shows that birds can hear in time far better than we can. We call it temporal resolving power. Basically, what that means is when we slow something down maybe eight times, as I have here in the lower right, when we slow this down eight times, perhaps we are beginning to hear the details that the birds themselves hear. Now these Anna's hummingbirds have to hear the details because they have to learn these songs from each other to have dialects. So I'm gonna play this at one eighth speed.
I have to believe that the hummingbirds are hearing all that when they listen to each other. So I have a visual illustration of song dialects in the Anna's Hummingbird here. And I say visual because it's, it's more difficult to hear. All I ask that you do is compare these two sonograms in the lower panel here. They are two birds from the same place. Songs are quite similar. They have features that the birds at these other locations do not. Dialects in the Anna's Hummingbird. Who'd have thought, huh? Also dialects in one of my favorite birds, chipping sparrows. People think of them as rather unexciting songbirds. They have such simple songs. Uh, what could be exciting about listening to a chipping sparrow? Well, I think there's quite a bit. And when I say many dialects, quite often you can walk through a park or if you're a golfer and you, excuse me, you walk a golf course Position yourself between two neighboring chipping sparrows and quite often you will hear that they sing identical songs. I'll play two songs, one uh, from each of two neighbors here, and you can see the similarity and you'll hear the similarity too. There are dozens and dozens of different songs that chipping sparrows sing. Here's another example at the other end of the spectrum, quite sweet and beautiful, not so chippy at all, but again, two neighbors having essentially identical songs. And what's so neat about this is each chipping sparrow male learns his song from one individual other adult male. So when you see these kinds of miniature dialects, and at most you'll have two, three, at most four birds in a little dialect area, all singing the same song, you know that they have learned their songs from each other. And it's just nice acknowledging that as you stand between two birds, you hear the similarity in their songs, and you can say, aha, I know exactly how that happened. There's a special bond and relationship between these two birds. One is the younger, one the older. Uh, there's some other variations that, that could have happened there too to get that, that result, but, but it's very nice. And you might say, well, still not very exciting, but to me, at dawn, these chipping sparrows provide one of the, one of the most intriguing uh, examples of what birds do during the dawn chorus. So what I have here are, oh, just nine seconds of singing between, among three birds. Now, chipping sparrows during the day, they sing from the tops of trees, a simple song, five, maybe even 10 seconds long. They wait a while, they sing that song again, but at dawn, they are singing on the ground, here I am standing on a paved road in Missouri next to the Mississippi River in the dark. I never see these birds, but I can tell by looking at the sonograms, each of three males has a unique song. Here is bird one, here is bird two that has come in here, and bird three comes in here. They're sitting on the ground spitting brief songs at each other, and you can hear their wings as they flying around and whatever they're doing, I would need night vision, but I'm gonna play this nine seconds. I'm not gonna to try to follow along and, and it's dark. You can't see the birds. Uh, you might close your eyes too and just listen. Uh, very nice, you hear the yellow-breasted chat in the background. Amazingly, and you can listen to five minutes of this if you go to song 498 on the web. Amazingly, 30 seconds later, something has changed. Bird three has left this little arena and bird four has arrived. And uh, bird four song, I think this is bird four song right here. Luckily, all these birds have unique songs. None of them have similar songs. And the logical question to ask is what is going on here? Well, I think the chipping sparrows give us a little window into what is going on during the dawn chorus among, do I dare say all birds, all birds that are singing their hearts out at dawn. 
in so many species. I have been out recording the dawn chorus and what you find, oh, chickadees, tanagers, the warblers, uh, you find that males congregate at their territorial boundary and they have a little song battle. Uh, Louisiana water thrush I was watching this year, it flew hundreds of yards down the stream to get to the territorial boundaries so it could countersing with its neighbor. I think the simplest explanation is that these chipping sparrows have provided us with an extreme example of what's going on. Oh, I need to show you the next slide, I forgot. Here are the birds that I'm saying they are lecking. Here you have those four birds that were in the dawn chorus sitting on the pavement. Once they left that dawn chorus, I then recorded two other birds who owned the territories there, and they are two different birds. They were someplace else during the dawn chorus. And birds three and four, why they visited other little arenas as well. I think the best explanation as to what is going on here is that this is actually a lek-like situation. The males are in this little arena, like sage grouse and prairie chicken. The males are in this little arena doing their thing with other males and the females have to be listening. What they're listening to, who knows? But there are interactions going on among these males, just as you would expect in a lek of the chicken-like birds in the Great Plains, for example. So that's my best guess. Uh, but it's truly astounding to be standing there, minding your own business, expecting nothing, and suddenly the chipping sparrow chorus breaks out essentially at your feet. Very exhilarating. And you step back and say, where'd chipping sparrows come from? Well, a couple other birds in this genus, of course, field sparrows. They have a, a simple daytime bouncing ball song. At dawn, they have a more complex song and they chip frantically like this between songs. They're quite predictable on where they're going to sing during the dawn chorus and what fun to be standing next to the bush where you know that field sparrow is gonna wake up with all that fire in the belly and sing. Uh, there's a good bucket, bucket list item for you. Not gonna take the time to play them. I'm going on to the brewer's sparrow. Uh, Again, such simple daytime songs. Uh, but what they do at dawn is truly extraordinary. And I can remember this so well. It was one of those days in Idaho where I had to be out in the sagebrush early, just and you know, you could feel the sun's first rays approaching you at about a thousand miles an hour from the east, and the dawn chorus is outpacing the sun. And sure enough, the brewer sparrows, sparrows start this dawn singing, and it is a continuous series of long songs by these males. In this recording 505, I'm standing, I can still smell the sage and feel the whole situation. The parabolic reflector is aimed at one tiny little place in the sage, and the birds are coming and going. You can hear their wing flutters, and this is constant singing. Uh, just like those chipping sparrows. And here you can see that there are two birds simul singing simultaneously, uh, one here in the higher register, the other in the lower register here. I encourage you, put it on your bucket list, go experience it. I'm gonna wrap this up um, and simply say, yeah, go out there and listen. Um, yeah, listen at all kinds of levels, but if you really want to get into it, listen to one singing bird. Compare successive songs. Are they the same or different? How does he change in different contexts and through the singing season, and especially during the dawn chorus? Can you find a handle for more complex singers, a unique song that you will recognize definitely when you hear it again? That's the best way to figure out what these birds are doing with these long uh, complex repertoires. And listen to singing neighbors. How is each individual fitting into this singing community? Any female singing? Back up. Listen to all the tanagers. How do they differ? The kingbirds, all those impidnax flycatchers. Just try to think in an evolutionary context about how each came to be. Mimicry, dialects, and oh my, 
if I am not out during the breeding season when the birds are singing, with full intention of recording what these birds are doing, if I do not hear that first peep from the bird, if I don't know where he is awaking and what he does in those first few seconds of the morning, I feel like I have lost the morning. So much out there, it's restorative, it's educational, happy listening to you. Well, um, thanks so much, John. That was uh, an amazing talk. And I think we all learned quite a few things from it. I have to say our Q&A has already been populated with some of the most um, detailed and um, academic questions I think we've had to date. So I hope you have fun answering some of them. Oh, um, I, I have till midnight, I'm here. Yeah, I mean, and some I think are even a little controversial. So I'm gonna jump in. Um, people who ha have good ears are already, or musically inclined, um, jumped right in right away. So we have one. Um, one person is asking that a perfect, um, Western music intervals are based on ratios of acoustic frequency. A perfect fifth is a three to two ratio, for example. Are bird songs based on some overriding physical relationship? I barely understand this question. <laughs> oh my. Um... You know, birds do their thing. And uh, I flunked piano lessons as a kid. I'm not the best person to address this question. I do know that there have been a fair number of attempts to shoehorn uh, what birds do into musical uh, terms that, uh, for humans. So I'm always a little bit skeptical when we say that, well, the birds are singing in a perfect this or that, but it's entirely possible. But I envy the musicians who can take their good ears and experience and, and uh, apply it to bird song. But I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to fail this person. I, I think we all are going to fail this person. So we're in good company, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, let, me, let me skip to something that I think you'll be able to answer more easily. Uh, someone wants to go, know um, a way to go about distinguishing a chipping sparrow and pine warbler song. Ooh, chipping sparrow and pine warbler. Um, oh, I'd love to take this person out with me to a pine warbler population, and we would be out there waiting for the first peep of that pine warbler. And what we would hear once this pine warbler got into his dawn chorus, we would hear this pine warbler singing five, maybe even more different songs. So if you want to distinguish chipping sparrows and pine warblers during the dawn chorus, why, that's pretty simple. But I, all right, the real question is, how about later in the day when each, the pine warbler then resorts to one song later in the day, and as does the chipping sparrow. And oh my, the chip, the, the pine warbler always has a little bit of a lilting quality to me. The chipping sparrow is, I think it's just constant throughout the song, and the, the pine warbler kind of trails off, trails down a little. Um, but that said, it's difficult. I'll admit that. Oh, okay, so let me, this is somewhat related. Um, someone else wants to know more about chipping sparrows. Do they, um, in the same flock, will they sing in the same dialect? And are dialects usually found within small or large geographical ranges? Oh, by most dialects, when we talk about dialects in, in normal species, we're talking about, you know, could, well, it varies so much by the species. With birds like the chipping sparrow, I'm calling dialects just two or three birds singing the same song together because they've learned that song from each other. And the same thing happens in indigo buntings and uh, lazuli buntings and sometimes yellow throats, common yellow throats, where a couple of males, uh, been well studied in indigo buntings especially. You can have tiny little dialects of several birds with similar songs, but travel just a little ways away to the next hedgerow, and the birds have different songs. So, Basically, I'm saying, I guess, chipping sparrows, I'm calling a dialect just a, a, two birds, two or three birds. Okay, like, so two birds from Yonkers, one from Brooklyn. Like, you'd be able to tell them apart in New York terms. Oh. Like, you know, something, 
All right, this, yeah. gets, this gets complicated. Let's, overall, let's say chipping sparrow, we can find maybe 30 to 40 different chipping sparrows in, among all chipping sparrows in Eastern North America. And those 40 or so chipping sparrow songs are distributed throughout the range. But what you find is that you listen to one male at one location, there's a fair chance that one of his immediate neighbors will have that same song. So I'm not sure this is coming through. This is a, chipping sparrows are a challenge. Uh, they have so many different songs, but by chance alone, you would not expect two neighbors to have identical songs. And it's been shown, I had a graduate student working on this thing, uh, wonderful, you know, detailed study. And he banded all these young birds and he could show that a young bird could learn the song of an adult either in the first summer when the bird was just a couple months old, or he could learn that song in the next year. And then they, they settle next to each other. Uh, so there's the tutor and the young bird. And so you can end up with two birds with identical songs and maybe only two. So there is your dialect, but that same song might occur a mile or two away. Um, that's amazing. I'm gonna, no, you're doing a great job with actually the hardest questions any speaker has encountered, I think. So um, I'm gonna move on. So um, someone wants to know, do non-learning, do non-learning sub ocenes have a different set of songs for different occasions or interactions as you describe for some of the ocenes? Oh, we, you know, an alder flycatcher has just one song we think of. A willow flycatcher has three different songs. People who know flycatchers better might say, well, they certainly vary their songs a lot depending on the circumstance, or maybe they're using vocalizations that we might not classify as songs. So I don't want to sell these birds short, but, but Oh, okay. Yeah, let's go to uh, let's go to Eastern Wood Peewees. Uh, during the dawn chorus, they have an exhilarating, beautiful sequence of of two different songs that they sing. No, three. Sorry, they got three different songs they sing during the dawn chorus. But one of those is taken away when they sing during the day when they have just two songs. And so, yes, they do have wonderful dawn choruses that they sing, uh, and you won't hear those songs later in the day. So we don't sell those flycatchers short. Okay. Um, I'm going to move on to like to some method methodology type of questions or or ethics. So this is this is the next set section of interrogation. Um, so someone asked. They have a two prong question. Um, about your experiment methods. And they want to know, have you ever done an experiment involving birds in the past that you would not do today because of moral or, moral or ethical reasons? And in your opinion, what is important for the general public to know when it comes to the ethics of scientific exploration and birds? Oh my, that is tough. I have done some experiments in the past that I could not do today. I will fess up to that. As a scientist, uh, we did things to understand how birds sing. Um, and there are, there are benefits to these studies as well. Uh, I could mention one particular study. We wanted to understand how flycatchers develop their songs. And if the flycatcher songs did not learn, if the flycatchers did not learn their songs, but instead those songs were innate, which we did in fact show, meaning they were very different from how songbirds learn their songs. If we could do that, we could learn so much about those thousand or so sub in the tropics, we could help identify how many, you know, units of, uh, we could, we could help understand the species diversity of sub in the tropics if we knew that those songs were innate and they were not learning their songs. So here's a great benefit by doing this lab rearing study. 
on these subassines to understand better species diversity, further work on those birds except just record them. But yes, ethics, though ethics are tough. Uh, there are benefits of studies, but uh, maybe I just leave it at that as an example. That's fine. We'll move on to another. This is maybe someone who's interested in some amateur or maybe even um, academic work with birds themselves. And they wanted to know, how are your recordings virtually free of background noise, which is a great question. And are you filtering sounds out to isolate the bird you're featuring and what recording devices do you use? Oh, the, um, it takes a lot of work to eliminate background sounds and, and human made sounds from recordings. And what I use is a parabolic reflector, uh, a satellite dish, it looks like a satellite dish. I've got some in the next room, but I won't bring them out. And that, that physical reflector is so directional and I put a sight right on top of the, the parabolic reflector and I can close my eyes and, and move the parabola around, listen to where it's the loudest in my headphones, look down that sight and there's the bird. Many people like to use shotgun microphones and they're far less directional and you're going to get a lot more background sound because they're recording at you know, quite a broad angle rather than a very focused uh, point. So that's one approach in the field using a good parabolic reflector. Then when we get the songs into the, uh, into the, the lab and into my little office here, and we want to clean them up, there are ways to clean them up just as pictures can be cleaned up with Photoshop. And to share them those 70 some hours of sounds on the, on the website, I have listened to each one of those and you can remove sounds if they are undesirable. Was there more to that question? Um, I just, and then I think just specifically what devices you use, but yeah, it was about filtering and, and how do you get it clear of sound? So I, I think you covered a lot of the bases. Yep, I use a good digital recorder, parabolic, reflect, parabolic reflector, headphones. I use Isotope RX, which is a software program, much like Photoshop for, uh, for pictures. So someone wants to know, and this has been a recurrent theme since we've taken our Linnaean lectures online, a lot of people want to know about differences in nature because of, um, of the pandemic and the anthropos. Someone wants to know, can you talk about the new song that is being sung by the male white crowned sparrows in San Francisco since the traffic noise is quieted? I read that its song was sung 50 years ago in quieter times, and now the young males are singing it as well. Is this a large number of species? Is this happening with other species? Oh, I have not studied that paper carefully. Um, let me just say, there are some good stories published that people want to hear and they don't always have the scientific basis behind them. And I'm reluctant to say more than that uh, at this point. I think that's totally fair. And like I said, these are some of the most difficult questions tonight. So I really, I mean, congrats to our audience for coming up with them. These are, um, wonderful, these are wonderful questions. They are. They're I know I know that study got a tremendous amount of press, but I know too much to answer that in a, in a celebratory kind of fashion. So I need to leave it at that. Yeah, this is a real thinking audience. Um, next time we'll just have a, a dinner party with 200 of us and we'll talk about oh. it all night. Oh, I love thinking audiences. And if this person wants to contact me directly where we can have a little private conversation, I'd be more than happy to, uh, to address yeah, what is, should Can people reach out to you via your website? Is that a good way to reach you? Uh, Donald Kruzma at gmail.com. I'm happy to hear from anybody. Okay, you might, might get a lot of questions. Um, um, and that's it. Let, let, me, let me say one more thing. I could also say that if somebody wants to download sounds from that website, they are more than welcome to do it. They can do it one sound at a time, but there are 700 some. If somebody wants to download 
all 70 some hours with a single click, email me and I'll give you the link to do that. You'll, you'll probably be getting an email from me in about 10 minutes. So that sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> um, I also, I would encourage everyone to probably, we, we do post these on our website and I know I for sure will rewatch this one so that I can follow along and uh, take more note of some of the things you said. And with that, I'm gonna end on one last question um, and then we'll pass it back to Ken. But someone wants to know a question from an amateur birder. I'm still struggling to translate the descriptions of bird songs. Example, chickadee dee dee to the actual song when learning identifications. Any tips on how to make this easier? Oh, you know, I've been at this for 50 years and I don't often think about answering that kind of a question. I went to Australia some years ago. Years ago. I was impossible. I couldn't learn to recognize a single individual species. It was, so I appreciate this, this kind of challenge. And I think the only thing I can do is recommend that you pick an individual bird and listen to that single individual and try to understand the amount of variation that's happening in the songs of that one individual. Then choose another individual of the same species before onto other species. So it, it's one at a time, but, but there are other people who know a lot more about teaching, about uh, how to learn to recognize and identify these birds. And you know, Ken's probably one, he's teaching this course. Ken, we'll rely on you. <laughs> yeah, and to the person who asked the question, I'm still like struggling to understand, is that a blue jay or the swing set? In the pine needham so you know we can we can get together and figure it out but don i i just want to thank you so much this was a wonderful presentation um you know i hope people will reach out to you and i'm sure many will and thanks again i'm going to pass it back to ken to close the meeting my pleasure wow wow oh boy what a uh, what a night don that was that was beyond fantastic. That was truly, truly a treat. You must have some tape library. <laughs> I mean, you have 700, uh, 700 songs just on that one site alone, which you, uh, 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 I, I can't imagine the hours that you spent in the field. Um, and now you all know why this book, Bird Song for the Curious Naturalist, uh, was the book that I used to teach my course. Uh, really based on Don, Don you're, my, uh, you're sort of my phantom mentor. Um, your book, <laughs> your website, your, all the work you've done uh, with your recordings uh, is just so vibrant and so exciting. Tonight, listening for the first time to the Starling that you played just blew me away. Uh, somehow I missed that one in my, in my, my class. Um, I'll, be, I'll be putting it in there, you can bet. But the mimicry of... Uh, one bird imitating two species with two songs using two, both of its voice boxes and the, the syringal muscles that, that are necessary to do that. I mean, just, just let Beyonce try that. <laughs> and I like Beyonce, but she's got nothing on uh, European starlings. This was a terrific, terrific pro, uh, uh, program. 273 uh, people tuned in. There were over 20 really wonderful questions asked. And Don, uh, thank you kindly uh, again for such, such, a, uh, such a wonderful program tonight. My pleasure. Thank you to the Linnaean Society. Now, I hope that everyone who had the opportunity to be with us tonight will return for next month's program when we present David Haskell and the Songs of Trees, Stories from Nature's Great Connectors. Until then, good winter birding, everyone. Keep those ears open. Stay healthy, stay active, stay positive. Have a very, very warm and wonderful holiday season. And to all, a good night. <laughs>